My name is Roger Bulger, and I uh, seek meaning in my life, at least partly, through being president of the University of Texas Health Science Center, which, in an administrative job like mine, frequently provides you with surprises. <clears throat> uh, today is a great pleasure, because we are not only having here and having the privilege of uh, being with a great personage, but the whole event, in fact, is very symbolic to me of what we're here for. If you think about it, uh, this event is, came about through uh, the School of Nursing and through the Dean of the School of Nursing and has brought uh, through the uh, basic mechanism of a public institution for higher education to a large medical center, public and private, uh, a, a subject about which we wish to hear. It's sponsored, really, by a gift from the private sector. And it is being held in an auditorium that my understanding is, is owned, in fact, by the Houston Academy of Medicine, and the Harris County Medical Society. It demonstrates quite graphically that we are a learning community and that this is a university at large and it's a great privilege for me to be able to participate in that through this mechanism. And I'm very proud of our institution in being able to do that. It seems to me that we so often in these situations find ourselves in the position of wanting to thank Dr. Jack McGovern for a variety of things. This is the John P. McGovern visiting professorship and it is through his generosity that we have it. Dr. McGovern has uh, the distinction of being the only individual in the history of the Health Science Center to be on the faculty of every single one of our six schools. He's also on the faculty at Baylor, at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and at the University of Texas at Austin, if I'm not mistaken. He has 18 honorary degrees from uh, institutions around the nation and the world. He came to this through being a distinguished physician. The McGovern Allergy Clinic is the largest in the world and really is a creature of his. And while he was being a physician, he has found time to publish numerous articles in science, in history, in ethics and human values that are excellent pieces in all of these various areas. And now he continues to encourage us through his gifts to get into these various areas and to broaden our horizons and uh, enhance our lives. Jack, would you be willing to stand up for just a second? I know that's painful, but you could even just wave but I, and let us express our thanks. I know the next statement I'm going to make for a fact is true. No one does that by themselves, and at least half of his papers have been written by his wife. <laughs> and she's there, too, and we'd like to thank Kathy for uh, all of her contributions in all of this. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Having welcomed you, let me now turn the microphone over to Pat Stark, the Dean of the School of Nursing, and the person who, in another way, has uh, certainly been the, the point of leverage for our being able to be here today on this occasion. Pat? Thank you, Dr. Bulger. <clears throat> on behalf of the faculty and students of the School of Nursing, I welcome you to the first John P. McGovern Lectureship in the School of Nursing. I appreciate your presence here at the noon hour, and I know that some of you are missing your lunch, but I assure you that you will enjoy the feeding of your noetic self or your spiritual self. I would like to invite you to a reception immediately following the presentation at 2 o'clock, which will be in the grand ballroom down the hall in the doctor's club. Dr. Frankel has given his permission for tape recorders to be used, but asked that they not be transcribed. He can be responsible for what he says on tape, but he cannot be responsible for how it might be transcribed. He does not mind photographs as long as they are not distracting. 
We do plan to have questions and answers uh, at the end of his lecture, and we will ask that you stand and ask your question, and then we will repeat it for the microphone, over the microphone. At this time, I welcome Mr. Kenneth Betts from the mayor's office, representing the Honorable Kathy Whitmire, mayor of the city of Houston. Mr. Betts. It's indeed a real pleasure for me to be here this, this afternoon and present this proclamation on behalf of the mayor and to officially welcome Dr. Frankel to Houston. I actually had to talk one of my colleagues out of this presentation. I learned about it this morning and within a few moments had convinced her that I would be the best representative of the mayor's office. <laughs> the mayor regrets that she cannot be here, but she had a previous engagement and I know that many of you have probably read Dr. Frankel's book, Man's Search for Meaning, and I read that book probably 15 or 20 years ago, and it, it really made a difference for me in my studies in a course in uh, contemporary religion that I took in college. And I'll never forget that book, and, and it was very inspiring and very touching. And so I had to tell you that so that you'd understand why this particular event is meaningful to me. It's indeed with great pleasure that I present this proclamation to you, Dr. Frankel. I w I'd like to read it, and you can stay seated while I read this. <laughs> it's not that long, but... Dr. Victor E. Frankel Day, whereas the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Nursing is privileged to sponsor a visit by the noted Austrian psychiatrist, Dr. Victor E. Frankel, who will present the John P. McGovern Lecture of the Rehumanization of Psychotherapy on May the 24th, and whereas Dr. Frankel, who is world-renowned for his work in logotherapy and man's search for meaning of life, and has been many times honored and recognized by his peers, governments, and other professionals, is the author of Man's Search for Meaning, which many cite as one of the most important books of this century, and whereas this significant event will be viewed by thousands of people either in person or on closed circuit television throughout the Texas Medical Center and Houston area hospitals. Now, therefore, I, Catherine J. Whitmire, mayor of the city of Houston, do hereby proclaim Friday, May the 24th, 1985, as Victor E. Frankel Day in Houston, Texas. And it's indeed a pleasure to present this to you in honor of your visit to Houston, Dr. Frankel. honored me on behalf of the mayor of this city, but you have also moved me deeply. You cannot know why, but you certainly don't know that actually instead of your city's mayor honoring me that way, scarcely deservedly, I would have to honor Houston, or for that matter, uh, matter, Texas as a whole. Because unless young men, soldiers recruited from Texas, and certainly among them some from your city, had risked their lives, and some of them, unfortunately, sacrificed their lives as soldiers to free me from my last concentration camp after 1945. There would not have existed any Dr. Viktor Frankl, even less any logotherapy. And now we will understand what I meant when I said, it's deeply moving me this day, this moment, but I ask you to report to your mayor that Actually, she should be appointed honorary logotherapist. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
Dr. Ed Lazar from Illinois, a member of the Board of Directors of the Institute in Berkeley, California, is here to make a special presentation. Dr. Lazar, while he is coming to the front, could I ask that any other members of the Institute of Logotherapy stand? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> to me, being with Dr. Frankel has always been a, a moving and rewarding experience. And I hope this morning that I can reciprocate, even if it's only in a very small way, to help mark Dr. Frankel's 80th year of searching for meaning and for helping others to search for meaning. So on behalf of the World Congress and the Institute of Logotherapy, I would like to present to Victor Franco this unique book of meaning. Dr. Franco. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's overwhelming to accept this, and I shall thank each of them who have contributed from the depth of my heart, particularly you. Thank you. I will have to add that we have two authors uh, who contributed to this book in the audience, Dr. Gordon Hatcher and Miss Jamie Stark, who's my daughter. Very pleased. I would like to read a telegram that I received from California. This is to Dr. Victor Frankel. The Board of Directors of the Institute of Logotherapy in Berkeley, California, would like to extend to you our heartfelt congratulations on being selected to receive the Oscar Pfister Award for 1985 as well as the John P. McGovern Lectureship. Our love to Mrs. Frankel. And it's signed Willis C. Fink, President of the Institute of Logotherapy. Before I formally introduce Dr. Frankel, I would like to say a few words of thanks to some very important people. First of all, our president, Dr. Roger Bulger, because without his support and encouragement, I'm afraid we would get caught up in the high technology of this medical center, and he pulls us back and calls us back to humanitarian values. His wife, Ruth, is the first lady and the official hostess for the university, but she is also a professional woman in her own right and is our outstanding teacher of the year. And Ruth, we appreciate both you and Roger. I'd like to add a word of thanks to Dr. McGovern and to Mrs. McGovern on behalf of the School of Nursing. We appreciate what you're doing for us, and we are pleased that you are our clinical research professor, Dr. McGovern. To my knowledge, you are the first non-nurse to be awarded a professorship in the School of Nursing. <laughs> there is another person in the audience without whom this day might not have taken place because she takes very good care of our featured speaker a wonderful woman who gives meaning and purpose to Victor Frankel's life, Ms. Ellie Frankel. Ellie, would you stand and let us welcome you? A group of dedicated people have assisted in the planning of this day with a labor of love and a very real sense of meaning and purpose. They have been very supportive and very loyal to meet over the past few weeks to plan every detail of today's event. They have evolved from the Fl Frankel Planning Group to the Frankel Fan Club. Many people who were preparing for his visit, the photographers, the printers who did the brochure, read Dr. Frankel's book for the first time and became very, very interested in his message. I'd like to recognize these people, if they would stand, the members of the planning committee. Would you please stand at this time and be recognized? I think they're probably all at their post, but let's give them some applause. <laughs> we also pleased to have Dr. Gerda Gomez and Miss Lisa Evers on the uh, front row who are our German translators in case we need that during the question and answer period. 
We have a very unique guest in the audience today, Mr. Jerry Long, who is a doctoral student in psychology at the University of Houston, and his parents are with him also. Jerry is a quadriplegic who exemplifies what having a permanent disability and using logotherapy can do in one's life. I think you received reprints of his article out front when you came in. Another professional whose life is a realization of Frankel's principles of logotherapy is Ms. Kay Hurth, who is an assistant professor in the School of Nursing and was recently selected International Handicapped Woman of the Year. She was also elected the Outstanding Teacher of the Year for the School of Nursing. And Kay, we're very pleased that you could be here today. It is my pleasure to introduce a man who is dedicated to rehumanizing psychotherapy. Dr. Frankel has been called one of the unique healers of our time. He is the father and the founder of Logotherapy, a movement whose time has come. Dr. Frankel received the MD degree from the University of Vienna Medical School and later the PhD degree. He was imprisoned in the Nazi concentration camps from 1942 to 1945. He later held the position of head of the Neurological Department, Polyclinic Hospital of Vienna for 25 years. He still holds the position of Professor of Neurology and Psychi Psychiatry at the University of Vienna Medical School. He is the president of the Austrian Medical Society of Psychotherapy and has received many honors, including Austria's highest award given only to 18 Austrian scientists. And very recently in Dallas, he received the Oscar Pfister Award. He is a visiting professor in several schools in the United States, including Harvard, and has honorary doctoral degrees from many universities throughout the world. His first publication was in 1924 at Sigmund Freud's personal invitation and was in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis. In 1925, he authored another paper in Alfred Adler's International Journal of Individual Psychology. He has written several hundred articles, at least 27 books, maybe more by now, and uh, these have been translated into, I think, 20 different languages. In addition, many books, articles, and dissertations, including my own, have been written from his theory. I must tell you how I came to know Dr. Frankel. As a doctoral student luxuriating in higher education, I came upon his work and was fascinated with how his ideas could be applied in the case of the handicapped. As a bold and eager doctoral student, I wrote to him in Vienna and was quite surprised and thrilled to receive a personal reply. Then in 1978, I had the honor of meeting him at the First World Congress of Logotherapy. Since that time, we have had other occasions to meet, including once in his home. He is a warm and personable person, as well as an outstanding scholar, and sees something different in the world and helps us all to find meaning in our lives. Would you join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Victor Frank? Dr. and Mrs. McGovern, President Balger, Dean Stark, Mr. Beats, thank you so much for your kind and warm reception. But as to the planning committee and their turning into a fan club, I must first of all raise a warning voice because although some of my presentations are given with the title humanization or rehumanization of psychotherapy, there's also another title that had been given 
to one lecture at one of the World Congresses of Logotherapy, and the title was The de of Logotherapy. <laughs> so please take heed. I'm no guru, and you are no fans, but you are people who are pulling with all of us on the same string as it were. Now, Dean Stark was kind enough also to mention that <clears throat> uh, I immediately answered a letter from her. And this is just due to the fact that although I not always agree with Sigmund Freud, he was and since that time remained, in a way, in a certain sense, a model for me. Each letter that I, as a young high school boy, exchanged with him was replied by a letter from him within about 48 hours, each one. And I think that this is also characteristic of his humanness in addition to his outstanding achievements in the given field. Now, speaking of Freud is quite appropriate at the beginning of such a presentation, since if anyone, a speaker, any speaker comes from Vienna, you certainly expect him, first of all, to speak with a heavy Viennese accent, as I do. But second, you also expect him to start his presentation with a reference, some sort of reference to Sigmund Freud, as I did right before. <laughs> but Dean Stark also mentioned and reminded me, and you told you, that one article of mine, the first more or less scientific, scientific article was published in 1924 in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis, and next year already, another article was published by Alfred Adler in his International Journal of Individual Psychology. In a way, I can regard myself or pride myself to be a fast breeder, <laughs> am I not? Anyway, both views on psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, and Adlerian psychology. Or, for that matter, their views on psychology at large, or even in a larger horizon, their views on anthropology, on the essence of human existence were not only different, but even more contradicting one another. But after all, this is the fate of whenever and wherever we, as it were, open the book of reality. Let me try to show this by some sort of illustration. If this here is the book of reality, and you have opened it that way, then you are confronted with different, not to say contradicting, pictures of reality on each page. And let me symbolize the difference by putting here a circle and here a square. Now, here you have a circle, and here, on the left page, on the right page, you have a square. We have learned in mathematics in high school that the age-old problem of squaring a circle has never been solved until today. <laughs> now, what about bridging these contradictions, these contradicting the pictures of reality in the book of truth, the book of science, by simply 
putting the front page in a perpendicular and orthogonal direction. In other words, what then results is the right page is here, here is the, uh, excuse me, this should be reverse, doesn't matter. <laughs> here is the circle, and here we have the square. Now you are justified in assuming that both pictures are nothing but the projections of a three-dimensional solid, a cylinder, into the ground plane and into the side view, respectively. Suddenly, the contradictions disappear, don't they? In other words, you have just to transcend into the next higher dimension, the three-dimensional space, rather than these two remaining staying in the two two-dimensional planes. And suddenly, as you notice, that although the, uh, the pictures are different, even contradicting one another, the oneness of reality, the oneness of that thing that has been depicted is still min maintained, or better to say, has been uh, preserved or, or resort, um, uh, preserved or uh, restored. Now, the same holds with the human reality. The same holds with man and the picture we describe the form of man, inasmuch as also, say, psychoanalysis and Adlerian psychology depict him differently, not to mention other schools. But we now will understand that all these pictures are more or less mere projections. We have first to pro pro project it, the human existence into a dimension which is lower than the human dimension. And now, in order to find out, find a way to transgress and transcend the differences, what we have to do is simply to enter, better to say, to follow man into the dimension of the specifically human phenomena. And then we'll understand that it's perfectly justified for any scientist to project reality, to see it unidimensional, as it were. But what the scientist should also do is to retain his awareness that he had artificially made a projection and that there are realities, there are phenomena which go lost. But if, he, if we enter the human dimension, the contradictions will disappear and something more. We'll be able to get hold, to mobilize, to muster those resources which are available in that human dimension, in the very the specifically human dimension, in order to include them, to incorporate them into our therapeutic uh, armamentarium. Now, the first of these human phenomena, specifically human phenomena you cannot find, you cannot meet in any animal's life, other animal's life, is the capacity of any human being to detach himself or herself from oneself. This uh, capacity has been mobilized uh, since logotherapy has been established in the form of a technique, psychotherapeutic technique, which is called paradoxical intention. I've started practicing it as early as in 29, but I first published on it in 39, and the uh, term paradoxical intention was coined by me only in 1947. Now, to understand what goes on in a case in which we practice uh, paradoxical intention, you have to start with a phenomenon that we psychiatrists are meeting very often, particularly in uh, phobic, neurotic patients, 
and which I could, uh, 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 in the form of a diagram, describe as follows. Any symptom, primarily harmless, scarcely to be noticed, results sometimes in anticipatory anxiety. This is the phenomenon we so often meet. This means the fear that it may recur. So the anticipatory anxiety evokes, the symptom evokes anticipatory anxiety. But anticipatory anxiety with any fear, uh, like any fear, is prone to elicit, to make come true, pass through what a person is fearing. In other words, a, uh, someone who had once been stuttering because he was, felt very embarrassed. And now uh, he fears that the next time he is confronted with uh, a person for whom he has a very high esteem, he might start again stuttering will also start stuttering because it will come true what he had been afraid of. So, symptom provokes, uh, evokes anticipatory anxiety, anticipatory anxiety provokes the, the symptom to reappear, to recur, and this again produces, <coughs> produces a phobia, produces the full-fledged phobia. And so a circle formation, a vicious circle, has been established. It's similar, or in a way parallel, with other neuroses, for instance, obsessive-compulsive neuroses. An obsessive-compulsive uh, uh, personality type, this might even have some, some uh, basis in the uh, structure of the brain, because in severely, in severe cases of uh, uh, obsessive compulsive neurosis uh, of that type, which is called in psychiatry anancastic uh, character structure, uh, certain uh, disturbances have been found by electroencephalographic uh, uh, tests. Now, however this might be, some such people are haunted, are plagued by certain ideas. They are afraid they might commit uh, homicide or suicide or uh, the strange ideas by which they are plagued might be uh, uh, precursors of uh, uh, full-fledged psychosis. And these people react in another way, but still, again, in, in the way of some sort of vicious circle, because they notice uh, the strangeness of obsessive ideas and react to them by pressure. But pressure, again, causes uh, uh, counter-pressure, and counter-pressure still increases the obsessive ideas and that way another such circle formation is increased. Now, how can we uh, counteract these, uh, these feedback mechanisms? How can we unhinge all these circle formations? Simply, we can do so also sometimes by pharmacotherapy, or at least starting with pharmacotherapy. But the simplest way is paradoxic intention. Because at the moment that you tear out the wind from the sails of anticipatory anxiety, you may destroy the whole circle formation. That is to say, if someone who is afraid in simple words, in plain words, that when he leaves his house, say a case of agoraphobia, he might uh, collapse, he might faint, he might uh, get a stroke or a coronary. And if this man who is plagued by this anticipatory fear and that fear which causes the whole circle formation, if he now does exactly the contrary he had been doing all the time, in 
insofar as he from now on tries, if he for a moment only, the uh, tongue in his cheek to wish precisely what he, he had been afraid all along. At the same time, as I put it before, the wind is taken out from the sails of his anxiety. <laughs> and at the moment that anticipatory anxiety is annihilated, it is not compatible with the wish. If I wish to faint, if I leave my house with the strong wish, now for a change let's faint, for a change yesterday I had uh, two strokes, T today I would like to have three strokes, <laughs> and so forth. At that moment, all these patients start laughing within themselves in the same way as you right now did. And at that moment, the incompatibility with anxiety comes to the fore and a distance is put between the symptom, the pathology in themselves, and the selves of those pers neurotic personalities. And now we understand how come that th this capacity of self-detachment, the specifically human uh, capacity, Come, uh, is utilized in the form of paradoxical intention. And uh, I don't wish to uh, quote uh, single cases because today psychotherapists, scientifically oriented psychotherapists, are not satisfied with single case studies, not satisfied with what they call, particularly the term is used in behavioristically oriented circles, they are not satisfied with anecdotically, in an anecdotical way to show the success of a certain, of a given method or technique. But they wish to establish, to conduct experiments. Now, uh, there are several experiments that have been conducted throughout the last 10 years, about 10 years. Uh, in uh, Montreal, a group, is there a teamwork that has come up with the first experimental study showing that uh, paradoxic intention really works. And throughout the last 10 years, Michael Asher, a professor in Philadelphia, who was, as it were, the right hand of uh, no less a person than uh, uh, Wolpe, the founder of behavior therapy. And now he's his successor at the university in Philadelphia. Uh, Michael Asher has turned out about a dozen of publications of papers in which he could show by way of controlled experiments that paradoxical intention is not only successful, but uh, its uh, practicability is equal to other behavioristically uh, based uh, 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 techniques. And in certain areas of pathology, of psychopathology, even superior as to the therapeutic success. Now, <clears throat> so much for this more clinical aspect, but uh, uh, now let us turn again to the question of 19, my publication 1924, my publication 1925. In 1926, I first used the term logotherapy already, and this meant that a therapy uh, wanted to indicate that this therapy is meaning-centered and regards man as a being who is meaning-oriented. We speak in this context, as uh, uh, some among you might uh, know well already, of a will to meaning in counterposition to the will to pleasure, the concept that is used in psychoanalysis, although Freud spoke of a pleasure principle, as you know, and secondly, opposed in contradistinction to the will to power, that Nietzschean concept that has been also applied by Alfred Adler in his individual psychology under the designation denoted as the striving, uh, particularly the neurotics striving toward superiority. 
Now, actually, the will to uh, meaning is just one aspect of a more encompassing phenomenon, which uh, I have designated as self-transcendence. The self-transcendent quality of the human reality. This means no more and no less than that being human is always directed and pointing to something other than itself. Be it a meaning to fulfill or another human being lovingly to encounter. This means that basically, primarily, originally, a human being is never concerned with anything within himself or herself, be it pleasure or in the equilibrium to maintain, to restore, homeostasis as Canon uh, 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 termed it, and homeostasis, the inner equilibrium, a state without tensions between it, ego and superego and society and so forth, is what actually was meant by Sigmund Freud when he said that first the reality principle is just a servant of the pleasure principle, and the pleasure principle itself is a servant with the purpose to maintain or restore a tensionless inner equilibrium by, by uh, 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 how I should I put it, by satisfying drives and needs and instincts, or else by compromising between society, eat, ego, superego, and so forth. And this lack of the essential trait of self-transcendence in human existence is also and equally observable in the anthropology, in the image of man that Alfred Adler portrayed of the human reality. Inasmuch as upon closer uh, investigation and scrutiny, you notice, and I could offer you, uh, verbal quotations from Alfred Adler, he thought, he was convinced that whatever a human being is out to do or to find in life is actually, in the final analysis, analysis just motivated and caused by an original and primary basic feeling of inferiority. In order to compensate, not to say to overcompensate, this feeling of inferiority, man builds up, higher, heightens his self-esteem in so far as he builds up a striving for superiority. Actually, man thereby, human being thereby, just wishes to restore a tensionless state within himself, not to be any longer plagued by his inferiority complexes, but he's not reaching out beyond himself. He's not transcending himself. He's no longer interested in a meaning to fulfill for the meaning's sake, or in loving anyone else for the other, the partner's sake, but just to show that he's no longer inferior or to make people believe that he is no longer inferior. You see, there is this self-transcendent uh, transcendence of human existence, something that in the meantime has completely uh, disappeared. Now, as to the will to pleasure, it's unfortunately the truth that what is called in your country, and forgive my contradicting a paragraph in the Declaration of Independence, pursuit of meaning is self, is elusive an undertaking. It is, uh, 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 you cannot pursue uh, happiness, pursuit of happiness. You cannot pursue happiness simply because happiness must happen. You must let happiness happen. You cannot strive directly for it. 
You can only fulfill a meaning or love another person and thereby becoming automatically happen, happiness and pleasure are byproducts, are side effects, but not the real goal, the actual goal of human strivings. And any direct intention to gain happiness, to gain pleasure, is doomed to failure because the more you strive for it, the more you make happiness an aim in itself, the more you are missing this aim. This becomes most conspicuous in sexual pathology, psychopathology, because it turns out that the more a male individual uh, tries to show uh, off with uh, his uh, potency or a female individual tries to uh, prove to herself that she is fully capable of orgasm rather than being frigid, all the more she is doomed to, uh, uh, to frigidity and he is doomed to impotence. So if you take the pleasure principle uh, sincerely, you stick to a pleasure principle, applying it, uh, you are uh, foundering, in other words, the pleasure principle turns out to be a fun spoiler rather than a servant in the pursuit of happiness. Now let's leave this uh, problem and let's just uh, point out that this forcibly striving to attain happiness, sexual pleasure, and so forth, is what we call in logotherapy hyperintention and counteracted by what we use in logotherapy, namely de-reflection against hyperreflection, against observing and watching oneself and strongly striving to uh, show uh, to attain pleasure. And here we have the third circle formation in sexual neurosis, namely the striving to obtain uh, sexual pleasure, the hyperintention, as I called it before, resulting, or better to say, accompanied uh, by hyperreflection, intention, reflection, which again increases the hyperintention. And what we have to do is to bring into play, as it were, centrifugal forces. Instead of watching and observing one's own sexual activity, the respective individual has just to, uh, 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 instead of intending forcibly sexual pleasure, the individual has rather to care for the partner by giving himself and instead of reflecting upon sexual activity, he has to forget himself. Giving himself or herself and forgetting oneself, in other words, de-reflection, restoring the self-transcendence, you see, thereby even in sexual life it's absolutely down to earth as it were, the self-transcendent quality of human existence, in this case, in the realm of human sexuality, plays an important role. And if not, we have to substitute hyperintention and hyperreflection by self-transcendence in order to arrive at therapeutic success. Now, incidentally, <clears throat> you hear again and again people speaking of and recommending self-actualization rather than self-transcendence. Well, self-actualization is, of course, a, a marvelous thing and to be recommended uh, on the widest, in the widest uh, realm. However, self-actualization, uh, um, exactly as happiness or pleasure, is again a byproduct, a side effect of meaning fulfillment or for that matter of self-transcendence rather than a goal. And throughout the last years of his all too short life, the great Abraham Maslow, who was the real founder of the uh, true concept 
of self-actualization, has uh, converted himself, as, is, as it were, to my basic assumption that you cannot, I'm now quoting Abraham Maslow, you cannot obtain self-actualization by hunting for it, by chasing it, but only by, on a, on a, a detour, as it were, that is, by devoting oneself to selfless goals. These are his words. And in a comment uh, to a paper of mine, he expressed this also verbally, verbally publicly, and openly. I'm reminded in this context of an interesting saying, uh, 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 utterance, by no less a person than Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer once said, the only really happy persons I've ever met in my life were those who had been devoted to a cause, have been serving a cause higher than themselves. So in other words, by self-transcendence, by virtue of self-transcendence, by giving yourself to the service of a cause higher than yourselves, or by giving yourself in the uh, setting of loving another person, a person other than yourself, you are actualizing yourself not by aiming at it, not by chasing it, but rather in, the st in the terms of a uh, side effect or a byproduct. And that's why I'm used to compare by way of a simile or an analogy that seems to be helpful if it comes to understanding what uh, that guy Frankl means by self-transcendence, uh, it has nothing to do with transcendence in a religious sen sense, of course. Now, I'm used, I'm often asked to use this analogy of the I. Ironically, the capacity of our eyes properly to function, that is, to, uh, to, perceive, to perceive the outer world visually, this capacity is contingent of the eye's incapacity to see itself. If you forget and neglect uh, um, uh, using a mirror, when do our eyes see anything of themselves? If they are diseased, if I see some cloud uh, in the visual field, then it might be a cataract from which I am suffering. If I see rainbow halos around the lights, it might be a glaucoma in heightened tension in a special uh, 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 part of my eye bulbs. Anyway, whatever I see in such cases, I notice, I perceive my eye or something going on within my eye. But then, and to the same extent, the functioning of this eye is impaired. It is the same with man. The more man is reflecting upon himself, instead of giving himself, being concerned with the world out there, to the same extent, he is diseased, he has fallen prey to some sort of neurotic illness as it were. Now, how come that this important and fundamental phenomenon of self-transcendence has throughout decades been so much and completely, not to say completely, neglected in the field of psychological research? I may trace back this failure, this shortcoming, to, to the following to the following uh, circumstances. You might have heard of the Heisenberg, the physicist, physicist Heisenberg principle. That is, uh, uh, to modify it in a way that observation of a physical phenomenon is unavoidably uh, also alteration of the respective process. Now, if you imagine that here, is the observing eye of the psychologist. 
And the psychologist observes a human being, a human person, a human subject. He automatically modifies all the phenomena uh, connected with this subject by turning the subject into an object, an object of observation, not of participation, but of observation. But alas, it is the intrinsic, as I personally would say, the intrinsic characteristic and property of any human subject that it relates to objects of its own. Because we know since Husserl and Scheler, not to mention Brentano, the founders of the phenomenological movement in philosophy, that the main characteristic of cognitive activity is what is called intentionality. It is, I would say, the cognitive side or aspect of that fundamental uh, uh, trait and quality I've termed self-transcendence. In plain words, there is no thinking, but always thinking of something. There, even Abraham Maslow once said in, an, in one of his books, there is no blushing without a blushing about something. A feel of shaming, uh, shame uh, because of something. So always love, hate, thinking, feeling, all these phenomena, all these activities of the human mind are directed to an object of themselves. It's always thinking of something, loving someone, and so forth. And all these objects to which a subject relates are shut out, are excluded, and thereby the subject is turned into an object artificially by mere observation. But alas, here in the world, all these objects forming the world into which a normal individual is acting, incessantly acting, because a normal individual is not behaving like an animal, like anything that is made into an object. A human being is acting into a world. To use the phrase, so often misunderstood phrase, coined by Martin Heidegger, the greatest among the existential philosophers, human being is being in the world, with hyphens, in, uh, uh, inserted in the world. Without the world, the world of all these objects, a human being is not conceivable at all. You cannot think of any such being without its interrelatedness, its connectedness with the world. And all these objects forming the world of a human, any human being, are lost by the objectification of the subject. And the self-transcendence is lost. But within the world, there are also meanings to be fulfilled. There are also reasons to act into the world. There are also reasons to love a person, and so forth. In other words, the motivations are lost. And now, since an individual is seen in this context, in this way, is no longer motivated by reasons to act into the world, there must be substitutes for the reasons. And if you shut out the outer world, then what is left is instincts and drives, psychodynamic processes, or learning processes, conditioning processes. These are then what? No longer reasons to act. But causes, causes, what's the difference between a cause and a reason? If I cut an onion, tears come flow down from my eyes. The tears have no reason, but a cause, certain etheric oils in the onion. But if a beloved person dies, then I have a reason to mourn and to weep. You see, that's the difference. But here what is left is no longer reasons, 
they are shut out, but only the drives, psychodynamic conditioning processes, and so forth. No longer have you to deal with a human being acting into a world, but rather with a being reacting to stimuli the behavioristic model, or up-reacting his drives and instincts and all the tensions aroused and caused by drives and instincts, the behavioristic and or the uh, psychodynamic model. But this is no longer a true picture of man simply because it is not centering and focusing on the intrinsic phenomenon of uh, self-transcendence. Now let me come to the real point of rehumanization in a phenomenological sense. I said before that logotherapy is a meaning-oriented, a meaning-centered psychotherapy. But today we live in an era in which meaning seems to have been lost by ever more people. People are suffering from a, from a feeling of meaninglessness, which is accompanied by a feeling of emptiness, or as we call it in logotherapy, the existential vacuum. It manifests itself primarily in two, uh, two symptoms, in boredom and in apathy, whereby we could define boredom as a loss of interest, interest in the world and what's going on in the world, while apathy should be defined as the lack of initiative, of the initiative to take in order to change something in the world. Now, this worldwide phenomenon is spreading and increasing more and more, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but also in the Eastern world and even in the Third World. You might come across my uh, short, very short and brief definition of what causes this state of affair. I'm used to pointing out that in contrast to any other animal, man is no longer directed by uh, drives and instincts toward what he must do. And uh, in more recent times, he is no longer uh, helped by traditions and values transmitted through traditions toward uh, in finding what he should do, finding out what he should do. Now, neither knowing what he must do nor what he should do, he sometimes seems no longer to uh, know what he really basically wishes to do, and that is why he either tends toward uh, uh, just doing what other people are doing, this is conformism, isn't it? Or else just doing what other people wish him to do, and this may well account for so much totalitarianism still to be met in our world. Particularly in an industrialized society in, uh, which is out to, uh, to uh, uh, satisfy all human needs and the consumer society uh, which is out even to create ever new needs to satisfy them, we see that one need, and it's ironically the most human of all human needs, is neglected and is frustrated evermore, and this is the need for meaning. Now, uh, the problem is 
the effect, the mass effect, the collective effect, and particularly among young people, this is an increasingly important uh, problem, has become an important problem. You see, in Atlanta, Georgia, a couple of years ago, I was invited by the whole student body of uh, the University in Athens, University of Georgia in Athens, to uh, give them a lecture, and they insisted it should be uh, with the title is the new generation mad? <laughs> I rebelled, but they insisted. Well, I uh, had to take a taxi, and the cab driver uh, asked me, what are you doing in Athens? I said, I have to give a lecture tonight about, uh, about what are you lecturing, sir? Uh, is the new generation mad? Uh, he was started laughing, like you. And I suggested, don't laugh, but I make you a proposal. I take over your car, and you take over my lecture. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, sir, I could never do that. I said, you could better than I. I just arrived by plane from Vienna. How can I judge whether your new generation is mad or, or, or not? And uh, uh, just tell me, do you think that your new generation is mad? He said, of, verbally, of course they are. They kill themselves, they kill each other, and they take dope. Literally his answer. He had pointed out without knowing to the three aspects of that triad you could call the mass neurotic triad of today. Aggression, depression, and addiction. Aggression, increasing violence, wherever you look, and depression manifesting itself in staggering suicide rates, and uh, some form you could call uh, either aggression uh, against oneself or slow, slow suicide, and this is addiction and uh, substance abuse. Now this theory of mine, that this is in a way connected with the state of affairs mentioned described before, a feeling of meaninglessness, has in the meantime strictly empirically be evidenced. Let me just quote one single uh, such paper, uh, uh, Kripner's, uh, Kripner, a uh, rather well-known psychiatrist in uh, New York, has found that among juvenile uh, addicts, drug addicts, no more than one, no less than 100% of the cases screened by him declared life seemed to them completely meaningless, 100 percent. Now, per se, however, in itself, I do in no way regard the sense of meaninglessness as a disease. It may result in neuroses or in so-called neurogenic neurosis or else in mass neurosis. However, per se, it is rather a privilege, it is a prerogative of man, particularly of young people, not to take over to uh, the uh, values or meanings to their lives from the hands of traditions but to insist that they find independently their own values and their own meanings. This seems to me to be a privilege of particularly of young people. Now, where could they find meaning? A permissive way of education has throughout decades, most of all in your country, refrained from daring, from venturing to confront people, particularly the young generation, with ideals, with causes to serve, 
but just don't place demands on them. Let them uh, actualize themselves and vent their, their feelings and uh, uh, let them uh, give them an outlet and so forth. And this turned out to be a severe mistake. And that way, people were spared tensions because the tension between reality and the ideal state of affairs, the, ten the tension, the tensional field uh, in the polarity between what a, an individual is and what he should try to become has gone lost. And I'm always reminded in this respect, if I'm uh, venturing to make any such statements, people blame me that I s put uh, uh, men and uh, women on too high a pedestal. I'm an idealist and I think too high of them. And you know what uh, comes to mind in this context? What uh, what uh, uh, throughout the uh, latest, the 70s, when I was uh, Serving, do you allow me to use this? <laughs> when I, t I uh, took uh, flying lessons in San Diego, my flight instructor told me something which certainly in your eyes goes without saying. Namely, if I'm flying, wish to land in east, and I have a side wind condition, I will drift and will then uh, 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 say uh, land uh, here arrive in, in the south of east. So I have to do what the pilots call cabbing. I have to direct the plane toward, say, 70 degrees, north of east. The plane will fly that way. You notice that? In other words, it's the same with man. If I aim where I should land, want to land, I'm driven down. But if I'm crabbing and see my goal where it is not at all higher on a pedestal, as it were, then I arrive here. In other words, if you take man as he is, you make him worse. <laughs> but if you take... Kindly wait for the point before you. <laughs> if you take man as he is, you make him worse. But if you take him as he should be, you help him become what he can be. But this is not any information, any instruction from my flight instructor, but a literal verbal quotation from Goethe, the greatest German poet. If we take man as he is, we make him worse. If we take him as he should be, we help him become what he can be. So this is the best motto, I think, for any kind of psychotherapy. Now, how can we offer meaning to a young man in a given situation? What can we do in this respect? The only thing we can do, we cannot prescribe meaning. We cannot hand out a prescription of meaning. But we may well describe how the man in the street or the woman in the street goes about finding meaning. And then we'll find, as I believe that I could evidence, that meaning perception is something that hovers some somewhat midway between an aha experience along the lines of Karl Bühler's teachings and, on the other hand, a, a, me, a gestalt perception, say, along the lines of Max Wertheimer. In the usual traditional sense, a gestalt perception means that suddenly I become aware of a figure against a ground. The gestalt of this glass of water comes suddenly to my awareness. But in meaning conception, perception, as I see it, as I venture to state, what I become suddenly aware of in the sense of a Bullerian Aha experience 
is not a figure against the ground, but a possibility against the background of reality. The possibility to do something about reality, to change the situation if possible, and as I'm going to explain, if need be, to change myself. And it's interesting that so far, 20 strictly empirical research projects have been completed worldwide to the effect that in principle, any human being is capable to find a meaning for his life, irrespective and regardless of gender, of age, of IQ, of educational background, of character structure, of environment, and most interestingly, irrespective of whether or not he or she is religious or not. And if religious, regardless of whether or not uh, of uh, the uh, specific denomination to which he or she adhere. And how now can we explain this empirical fact? I would say that it will turn out about a close investigation along the lines of a phenomenological analysis. It will turn out that man or a woman is capable of finding a meaning first by doing a deed or by creating a work. Second, by experiencing something or by encountering someone. This means by loving someone. In other words, by work or in love, we may find a meaning creatively and or experientially. But most interestingly, even a human being who is confronted as the helpless victim with a hopeless situation, a fate that he or she cannot change, even then, meaning can be obtained, namely by trying to bear witness of the uniquely human capacity to turn one's predicament into a human achievement and accomplishment, turning a tragedy, a personal tragedy, into a personal triumph. Let me illustrate this by quoting a German bishop, Bishop Georg Moser, who in a small booklet is uh, uh, relating the following story. A few years after World War II, a doctor of his acquaintance examined a Jewish woman who wore a bracelet made of baby teeth and mounted in gold. A beautiful bracelet, the doctor remarked. Yes, the woman answered. See, doctor, this tooth here belonged to Miriam, this one to Esther, and this one to Samuel. She mentioned the names of her daughters and sons according to age. Nine children, she added. And all of them were taken to the gas chambers. Shocked, the doctor asked, how can you live with such a bracelet? Quietly, the Jewish woman replied, I am now in charge of an orphanage in Israel. Now, there are other such cases which 
should show, exemplify to you mere millions of, and billions of cases uh, to illustrate that if you cannot change the situation, you still can change yourself in as much as you can change your attitude to the unchangeable, to the unchangeable situation, in as much as you can rise above yourselves, grow beyond yourselves, and thereby grow in a direction which was, as it were, the point of destination of your personality. But please do not, do not forget that what I'm saying is not that perhaps you ascribe to me the conviction that uh, suffering is necessary, is indispensable to find meaning in no way. What I wish to convey to you is that meaning is possible, not suffering necessary, but meaning is possible if need be, even despite and even by virtue and thanks to suffering, provided to be sure that you have to deal with necessary, that is to say, unavoidable suffering. Because as long as or as soon as you can remove the cause of suffering, it's exactly what you have to do. This goes without saying for anyone who is uh, a member of the helping professions uh, for a, a doctor, it goes without saying that you have to uh, overcome to help to cure a, a suffering uh, uh, a person who is ill and suffering from a, any illness by removing the cause. But there are certain types or certain uh, periods in the personal history of any individual in which you simply cannot do anything and then say handicaps or fatal diseases in the four. Then what then is imp uh, uh, mandatory, what then comes to the four is the possibility, the principal possibility to do something about the situation, bestowing it with meaning, even in suffering by the attitude that we adopt. I could say it in a few words by pointing out that the priority stays with changing a situation, but the superiority goes to growing beyond an unchangeable situation if this should be necessary. A couple of years ago, during a teaching period in San Diego, I was given a paper by one of my students. She was a nurse. And this nurse deals in that paper with a 31-year-old mechanic who due to a, received uh, hundreds of thousands of volts of electricity through his whole body. And then she was, uh, he was brought to the hospital where she was a nurse. And both legs up to his knees and both hands to the mid-forearms were gangrenous or already mummified. And the surgeons who made the amputation, amputations and the anesthesiolog anesthesiologists and the nurses, faces with tears made the surgery. And she, my student, was a special nurse to Bob during the many weeks that followed. When he awakened from narcosis, he had to be told that his arms and legs had been removed. She searched for thoughts by which she may spark him with a meaning for his further life and in spite of his predicament. And then she describes how she used principles she had found in the literature on logotherapy, even self-detachment, even humor, and particularly self-transcendence. And then it turned out there was a young man who was paralyzed from the neck down, and she took Bob to visit him, and they became friends, 
and looked forward to seeing each other. I felt, she writes, he was transcending his human condition. Now they read together uh, Man's Search for Meaning and other books on logotherapy. And uh, again and again, she was, he was quoting by heart, meaning can be found even in suffering. He memorized the sort of a person a prisoner becomes is the result of an inner decision. Fundamentally, therefore, any man can, even under such circumstances, decide what shall become of him mentally and spiritually. He may retain his human dignity. The last inner freedom cannot be lost. This what was what he memorized again and again. And uh, in, it is this freedom uh, which cannot be taken away, which makes life meaningful and purposeful. Now imagine, after a couple of months, Bob opened a small business without arms and without legs, and is uh, able to support his family. Last summer, she writes, that nurse writes, in a specific, uh, specially equipped car, he drove his wife and two children on a tour to the United, uh, through the United States. He told her, his nurse, quote, I was very empty before my accident. I stayed drunk all the time and was bored to death. Now, with no arms and no legs, now he wrote to her, I truly know what, is, what it means to be happy. Isn't this incredible? It's just unbelievable. There is a worn out paper with a copy of my answer to a letter from you, Dean Stark. <laughs> I treasure this, a few lines. I'm not weary, I'm not fatigued, again to and again to quote it, also in my books. You wrote to me, I have a 22-year-old female client, client who was injured at age 18 by a gunshot wound as she walked to the grocery store. I wonder if you remember her. Her injury level is C4, and she can only accomplish tasks by use of a mouth stick. She feels the purpose of her life is quite clear. Is quite clear to her, imagine. She watches the newspaper and television for stories of people in trouble and writes to them, typing with the mouth stick, to give them words of comfort and encouragement. But if you still don't believe in such facts, and imagine it is fiction, just turn your looks to Jerry Lang, who is honors us by being among us. This is still more torn out because on a worldwide, uh, on worldwide lecture tours, I use this material. And I do not wish to embarrass Jerry by expanding my presentation of his achievements. Let me just from a year long correspondence with him, I have be, had the pleasure to conduct, quote, a few sentences. I broke my neck by diving accident, but it did not break me. I cannot uh, figure out how many hundreds of times I've read this, uh, this part of his uh, letters. My life is abundant with meaning and purpose. Abundant with meaning and purpose. Confront anyone confront the average citizen of any larger country in this world with this statement when he suffers from existential vacuum. He, Jerry, 
Joe's life is abundant with meaning and purpose. In another letter, without this suffering, the growth that I have achieved would have been impossible. And then he writes in another letter, my handicap will only enhance my ability, my ability to what? To help others. He's now involved not only in studies, but also is trained and uh, is in hospitals counseling people. And the, um, still, he says, there is no uh, conclusion, but the only conclusion is accomplishments such as these out outstanding uh, human accomplishments. Accomplishments are not to be rested upon, but built upon. Thank you, Jerry, for all these letters. <laughs> there is a meaning in life, an unconditional one. But what about death? Is there any meaning in death? Yes, there is. Because I contend that death gives meaning rather than robbing meaning from our lives. Imagine what would happen if we were immortal. We could postpone everything. <laughs> we need not take the uh, unique opportunity, opportunities to do something or to experience something or to suffer honestly and uh, boldly. We need not take any such responsibility seriously. But the logotherapeutic imperative, categorical imperative reads, Live as if you were living already for the second time and as if you had acted the first time exactly the wrong way you are endangered to act right now. This is an encouragement. This is an appeal to use each opportunity because in spite of all that transitoriness imbuing our mortal, our fi final uh, human existence, <coughs> excuse me, in spite of this transitoriness, what is really transitory is actually only the opportunities, the potentialities to fulfill a meaning. At that moment, once you have fulfilled a meaning, you, once you have converted such a potentiality into an actuality, into reality, you have done so once and forever. This means that you have rescued such a potentiality into the past, because in the past nothing is irrecoverably lost, but everything rather irrevocably stored and treasured. Usually we only are aware of these double fields of the transitoriness of our life, but what we forget and overlook are the full granaries into which we have, of the past, into which we have all along deposited the harvest of our lives. The deeds we have done, the works we have created, the loves we have loved, and last but not least, the sufferings we have gone through with dignity and with courage. So there's no need whatsoever to pity old people, to pity them because they have no longer any possibilities in the future. They don't give a damn for a possibility in the future because they have to be envied, simply because on the grounds of the fact they have all along realities in the past rather than mere possibilities in the future. They have the human dignity rests on the basis of the past wherein we have actualized meanings and fulfilled values. In other words, there is not only an unconditional potential meaning to life, but an unconditional value to each and every person in the world. And unless you acknowledge this fact, you only uh, 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 are indebted and owe it to your personal inconsistency if you are not pleading for euthanasia in the strict sense of Hitlerian, Hitler's 
activities in this respect. Those activities within uh, whose frame people were gassed and exterminated due to old age or incurable disease or mental deterioration in old age or whatever other handicap they might have been afflicted with. Now, you should not think that this is only uh, possible to persons who are uh, uh, overtly meaning-oriented. You should not forget that meaning orientation is something that is, again, available and observable to an incredible extent. It has been experimentally and by tests and statistically evidenced in a paper once published in the Journal of Consulting in Clinical Psychology by Thomas and Weiner, that physically ill patients who were critically ill had higher PIL scores than had patients with a minor ailment or non-patients. The PIL test is the purpose in life test that was created decades ago as the first logotherapeutically oriented test by James C. Crambo in Gulfport. And I wish to pay tribute to this great researcher who throughout decades has contributed further on and created some additional test batteries. And there is another uh, paper uh, published by Zülke and Watkins, also in the Journal of Clinical Psychology. I'm quoting uh, verbally, and they, they investigated the effectiveness of logotherapy with terminally, terminally ill patients. The patients experienced a significant increase in their, uh, in their uh, a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives uh, as measured by, again, by the purpose in life test. And uh, we owe to you the latest test has been created by your Dean uh, uh, Stark. And now to uh, conclude with, with a few remarks, what I just further on wanted to say to you, let me just point out that uh, you certainly have come across in one or the other book of mine that classical case of a general practitioner who could not overcome uh, the uh, depression after he had lost his wife whom he had uh, loved uh, more than everything else. And the whole therapy consists of therapy between quotations because I could not help this uh, colleague. The whole therapeutic uh, Socratic dialogue, better to say, consisted in asking him a question. What would have happened if not your wife, but if, your, if you had died first? Whereupon he replied, oh, how terrible this would have been for my wife, how much she would have uh, suffered. Whereupon it was left to me just to add one remark. You see, doctor, this suffering has been spared to your wife. But it's you, after all, who have spared her this suffering by surviving and mourning her. At the same time, his suffering had been bestowed with a meaning. The meaning of a sacrifice he owed to his wife, whom he had loved above everything else. And there it becomes perceptible to you that, as I'm used to showing my students, despair is not unconditionally con connected with suffering. Despair is. D equals S minus M. And this means despair is suffering without meaning. At that moment, you can bestow a meaning to despair, a meaning to suffering. At that moment, you are no longer desperate. And in such cases, in spite of severe suffering, 
as you could show from that material I confronted you before, at that moment, there is no suicide danger either. Now, what I wanted to say is that this story of the general practitioner is so often used in textbooks and so forth, and so often applied to themselves by people all over the world. I get the letters, I receive the letters from them, from them, that people assume this is a method in sign logotherapy. It is none. It was sheer improvisation. I've never applied the same thing anyone uh, at any time later on. It was sheer improvisation. You have to improvise. You have to adapt your therapeutic approach to each moment, and you have to modify it vis-a-vis -vis of each patient. You cannot come up with techniques that you are universally adaptable, but because you have to adjust each technique to a given situation and to the uh, person who is confronting you, be it who uh, 150 years ago came up with the concept of neurasthenia, once said and declared, if you treat two cases of neurasthenia in the same manner, you have mistreated at least one of the <laughs> <laughs> Still, you should not neglect or uh, disparagingly dismiss uh, techniques they have their value, as I was starting with to in uh, pointing out. There is a place for techniques in spite of all that. But beyond techniques, there is something. Techniques plus, plus humanness, particularly in an era, in an age where medicine also, psychotherapy becomes ever more over-technologized, as we might say. All the more it is important to be concerned with the plus when I said technique plus. And what is the plus? Let me illustrate it by uh, just one concrete case. I, again, am not weary of uh, uh, repeatedly presenting to my students. Once I was waking up at three in the morning by a telephone call, and a lady told me, wanted just to inform me that she is about to kill herself. And then I started talking with her, and as it happens, I know in this situation, how long we were talking together, it was half an hour. And finally, after elaborating all the arguments speaking against suicide and for survival, explaining this, presenting it, I had her to the point where she gave me her word, she will not take her life that night, but come to see me in my hospital on the next morning at 9 a.m. So this was talking together took place at 3 in the morning. At 9 a.m. she appeared in the hospital. And she started telling me, Dr. Frankel, you would be severely mistaken if you assumed that any of the beautiful arguments you presented me, you confronted me tonight, had any impact on my decision to survive and to continue living. But you see, the fact that I woke up that guy at three in the morning, it instead of becoming angry with me, as I expected him to be, to become, he patiently talked to me and listened to me for half an hour. Then I thought I should give life another chance. <laughs> now imagine, imagine, ladies and gentlemen, 
how impressed I must be that you were patiently listening to me, not for half an hour, but for three halves of an hour. Thank you.